Hi guys, and welcome back to another SIBO associated condition. In today's video, we're going to be talking about something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is celiac disease. As a celiac myself, I feel that this is a very important topic to cover, and it's very common because not only can the symptoms of SIBO mirror that of celiac disease or mimic it, but in some cases of what's called refractory celiac disease or non-responsive celiac disease, that is celiac disease that does not go into remission upon the adaptation of a gluten-free diet, in many of those cases, treating the underlying SIBO, if it is there, will lead to symptomatic improvement and put the disease into remission as we would otherwise expect with a gluten-free diet. So stay tuned to find out more about the connection between SIBO and celiac disease. Okay, first up, let's talk about the symptoms between SIBO and celiac disease, how they differ and how they are similar. I think by the end of this video, you're gonna see that the symptoms are much more similar than you otherwise would have realized. So as an example, Heaven knows that people with SIBO and people with celiac disease oftentimes complain of bloating. And rather than writing these out, I'm just gonna be lazy and do check marks. So bloating is a very common complaint, specifically in relation to eating wheat, barley, and rye. But we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Let's just say for right now that chronic bloating, particularly in response to meals, can be a very common symptom amongst those with SIBO and celiac disease. Other, other complaints include nutritional deficiencies. So deficiencies in things like vitamin D, vitamin A, calcium, iron, B12. These are all very common amongst people with celiac disease because of the villus atrophy, the whistling up and the degrading of those nice long villi, those finger-like projections in the small intestine that give you extra surface area. Normally, the villi give you all this extra surface area. So you can imagine cells of the intestine would be like this, and you get all of these little nooks and crannies where you can absorb nutrients. But for celiac disease, you end up getting these blunted villi that don't have as much surface area and are not capable of absorbing as much nutri nutrition. So nutrient deficiencies can be a thing for celiac disease and SIBO both. It's a little bit more common amongst freshly diagnosed celiac disease, in my opinion, but it is still there. Malabsorption and nutrient deficiencies are still exceptionally common amongst people with SIBO. Particularly from what I've seen, I've seen a lot of B12, iron, B1, and vitamin D, but that also might just be because of lack of sunshine. So it's hard to pin that on the gut 100%. But I've seen a lot of those nutritional deficiencies amongst my non-celiac SIBO patients. And then certainly deficiencies run the gamut in celiac disease as well. So nutritional deficiencies, bloating, also pooping problems. Now, more commonly, we're gonna see a higher frequency of diarrhea with celiac disease and a little bit more of a split with SIBO depending on what type of gas is produced. So if you're talking about methane versus hydrogen versus hydrogen sulfide, you're gonna see a little bit more of like an IBS Whoop, that's not an S, <laughs> IBS C or D or M with SIBO versus with celiac disease, you're gonna see a little bit more of the diarrhea predominant manifestation. But I have seen patients with celiac disease who complain of constipation as well. So don't let that throw you for too much of a loop. It can happen with celiac disease. I do think that constipation is a little bit more prevalent amongst people with SIBO though. So now we get into some, some of the lesser known things. So remember that I talked about villus atrophy, one of the absolute hallmarks of celiac disease. That and the fact that it gets better when you avoid gluten. So you go from these nice long finger-like villi in the small intestine that give you all this extra surface area, and then you get these blunted shaved down villi when you have uh, aggravated or current celiac disease. And then this should revert back to its original form. It should get better upon adaptation of a gluten-free diet. However, fun fact for you, oh dear YouTube viewers, is that you can get some villus atrophy with SIBO. Again, maybe it's not gonna be as severe. Maybe it's not gonna be quite as widespread, but it can happen. I've seen some research articles in PubMed sharing that when they've done these biopsies, they've shown some villus atrophy amongst people with SIBO. So food for thought, you could even get an endoscopy, be diagnosed with celiac disease based on this, and maybe have it be a false positive. 
it's really hard for me to say without looking at somebody's labs directly and confirming it. And you might even want to do, you know, SIBO treatment, get rid of the SIBO, and then do a follow-up endoscopy. But theoretically, this could happen, and it could lead to the false diagnosis of celiac disease. Because keep in mind, to zoom out for a minute, a lot of people have celiac genes. About 30% of the population, maybe 40% in Caucasian people, have at least one of the two celiac genes. But your genes do not make your destiny. Just because you have the celiac genes don't mean that you're going to develop celiac disease. Now, in my case, that was true. I have one of the celiac genes, and I did, in fact, develop celiac disease. But your genes don't doom you to that fate. Otherwise, 40% of the population would have celiac disease. So keep that in mind. But this villus atrophy can be found maybe to a lesser extent in SIBO. Similarly, probably a lot of you know about the stool test calprotectin. It's a marker for intestinal inflammation, particularly large intestine, aka colon inflammation. And it's caused by a, a type of white blood cell called neutrophils congregating in the colon and then churning up more of an inflammatory response or responding to an inflammatory environment. Calprotectin is usually used to differentiate between IBS and IBD, that is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But you can get a little bit of an uptick in calprotectin in kids with celiac disease. This does not seem to be true in adults. But in pediatric cases, that can be the case. And similarly, I have seen some data to support an increase in calprotectin amongst people with celiac disease. So that's another similarity that the two share. It's worth noting, with both of these conditions, the likelihood of it being as high as it is in inflammatory bowel disease is less striking. So you're gonna see, you know, for example, if a standard range, and I'm trying to think, because different labs have different ranges, if a standard range is anything below 100, you might see something in the 100s or maybe the 200s with both of these conditions versus very frequently in current aggravated uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and colitis, you're gonna see numbers in the four, five, six hundreds. So it's gonna be a bigger, starker contrast. But nonetheless, you could get some fecal calprotectin increased in both of these, which also makes the point that part of the problem for people with SIBO and part of the problem with, for people with celiac disease might be located in the colon, not just the small intestine, which is the part of the body that's gotten most of the press, right? We talk all day long about villus atrophy with celiac disease and nutrient malabsorption. And certainly the name small intestinal bacterial overgrowth makes us hyper-focus on the small intestinal environment in SIBO. But if fecal calprotectin is elevated in both of these, you would think that that means that there's some immune perturbation or inflammation or dysbiosis in the colon itself. So topic for another video another day, but food for thought, just keep that in mind as well. Now, the other things that these two can share in common, there has been some data to suggest that you have poor motility in the case of celiac disease. Sometimes that's with gastroparesis, sometimes it's globally, but poor motility certainly is the case for SIBO. And I've been saying this on YouTube for a couple years now. In my opinion, SIBO is a disorder of poor motility first, and it is a microbial issue secondary to that. You don't get the bacterial overgrowth and you don't get that stagnation and gas buildup if you don't have crappy motility point blank. So the poor motility had to come first, and then the microbial changes and the inflammatory changes came second. But nonetheless, I want to make the point that dysmotility sure as heck is common amongst people with SIBO, and it is indeed more prevalent in celiac disease patients than it is in quote-unquote healthy controls or healthy normals. Another thing to keep in mind for both of these, and we'll add another little check mark in the middle here, is inflammation or immune perturbations. Now again, we've done some videos like on the histamine thing and autoimmunity, but just keep in mind that there's a gazillion different immune cells, everything from neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, a million different T cells, and imbalance in that system or one type of cell population can cause inflammation. And that's why inflammation is so hard to talk about because it's really many different flavors of the same thing many different chemicals that are driving forward something that we broadly call inflammation. But immune perturbations or immune imbalance and the coinciding inflammation are very common 
amongst people with SIBO and celiac disease. So that also gets a little check mark. And now let's go back to something that can help you differentiate at least somewhat. And keep in mind, you could have both of these. But one of the things that I think is going to be more of a hallmark in SIBO as opposed to just celiac disease without SIBO in the picture is not only going to be intolerance to wheat, but intolerance to FODMAPs. That's, FODMAP doesn't start with a D. What was I thinking there? My goodness. FOD. So versus in celiac disease, you would expect to see more of an acute issue with wheat, barley, and rye, and those are high FODMAP foods. But if you have celiac disease with no dysmotility, no SIBO, you're just, you know, you're living on this side of the Venn diagram over here, you would expect profound symptoms from wheat, barley, and rye, but not so much from things like apples and avocados and onion and garlic and xylitol. You wouldn't expect a lot of symptoms if it's just celiac disease because the problem really ends up being gluten. Similarly, you know, to go on the flip side, if you have SIBO but you do not have celiac disease and you're dealing with more of a straightforward FODMAP intolerance because of the bacterial overgrowth, you could probably get away with a teeny weeny bit of gluten. So for example, you could go out to a sushi restaurant and have normal person soy sauce. You could probably go out to a restaurant or out with friends and have one beer. That might not be incredibly detrimental to a person with SIBO or it might be very minor bloating that they'll get versus somebody with celiac disease, even that little bit of gluten really has the potential to do a lot of damage. Similarly, cross-contamination. If you get french fries that were fried in the same oil, I know, I've been there, I've done that, I've got cross-contaminated before because I was lazy and I didn't ask. If you get cross-contaminated with trace amounts of gluten from fry oil or from mishandling of things at a restaurant, you would expect more of an inflammatory immune response and bloating and GI symptoms from celiac disease versus a person with just SIBO and no known gluten issue or no known celiac disease can probably get cross-contaminated and it's not really that big of a deal. So that's probably the biggest thing as far as trying to understand if you have one or both of these things, if you have more of a noteworthy response to FODMAPs across the board, so like onion, garlic, avocado, apple, peaches, plums, that sort of stuff, then I would lean a little bit more here. And you could back that up further by saying, you know, if you could eat a little bit of like a gluten containing soy sauce or a little bit of gluten containing alcohol or one bite of bread or one bite of something, you're probably more over here in this category. If on the other hand, you're fine with all the other FODMAPs except for the gluten containing grains, you could go out, you could have guacamole and onion and garlic and apples and watermelon and mango. But if you have a little bit of cross contamination at a restaurant, and then you feel like crap, you're probably either in the realm of celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which again is kind of a topic for a whole nother day. But that's the best way that you can differentiate symptom wise. The other thing too, like I said, you could have both, is that if you find out you have celiac disease and you treat it by going gluten free, and then you don't have a noteworthy response to that or a noteworthy remission from that within the span of six to 12 months, then that would land you in that category of refractory or non-responsive celiac disease. And amongst people with non-responsive celiac disease, there is a higher prevalence of SIBO than in the general population. So if you have gone gluten-free for six to 12 months, you feel maybe a bit better, but not totally better, that's when you might wanna start thinking about celiac disease. Speaking of which, we'll talk about research next. Speaking of research, let's talk about a little bit of the research behind the connection of celiac disease and SIBO. So I'm going to highlight two studies for you in this section, which is a study from 2020, so relatively new, and a study from 2003. In the 2020 study, the newer study, they took about 50 some odd patients with non-responsive celiac disease, people who had been on a gluten-free diet for at least six, if not 12 months with no response or little response. And from that group, they showed that 31% of those patients had SIBO in addition to celiac disease versus the controls only had about a 7.7% prevalence of SIBO. So about a fourfold difference between the celiacs with uh, 
unresponsive celiac disease versus the healthy controls, the age-matched controls. So definitely builds the theory. The problem is that they didn't go the extra step and treat the people with SIBO and then document those results. And that's why I want to highlight the 2003 study. It's a bit older and it's quite a bit smaller, 50 some odd patients with celiac disease versus only 15. But in that study, they looked at 15 patients with refractory celiac disease and they looked for people who had SIBO and they evaluated for some other stuff. About 5% of people had other, or I'm sorry, five of those 15 had other conditions that explain their symptoms. Everything ranging from lactose malabsorption to I think one person had Giardia infection or fat malabsorption. So about, you know, five out of the 15 had other diagnoses, but the remaining 10 people, 66% had SIBO. And then in that study, in the 20, or the 2003 study, they went on to treat those people for SIBO. And the funny thing is they only did rifaximin for one week. So it was a uh, subpar treatment to say the least, but nonetheless, it paints a picture. And after one week of treatment for SIBO, 100% of people said that they were symptomatically much improved. And that was at they followed up one month after the course of rifaximin had ended. So one lousy week on rifaximin, 100% of people noted improvement in their symptoms. It would have been really great if the 2020 study had taken it that step further and treated these, this 31% with a course of antibiotics or herbals and see, you know, to see if that created a resolution in symptoms. But nonetheless, you can start to build this hypothesis. And I will say for both of these, they use lactulose-based breath tests. And we know that there is an issue with false negatives and false positives with breath testing, particularly with lactulose. So bear that in mind as well, is that there might have been some false negatives or false positives in the mix here. But overall, a fourfold increased prevalence of SIBO amongst people with non-responsive celiac disease. And then in one study, they took those patients treated them for SIBO with an antibiotic, and then 100% of people said that they felt better undergoing that treatment, builds a pretty profound link, and it builds this hypothesis that if you have not gotten full resolution on a gluten-free diet for your celiac disease, you really should consider getting tested for SIBO. Last but not least, let's talk about some of the links between SIBO and celiac disease and why one might cause the other. Now, in this case, I could make the argument for celiac disease triggering SIBO or the case for SIBO triggering celiac disease. I think that it could go both ways. But let's talk about some of those similarities, some of those root causes, about one, one causing the other or vice versa. And hopefully this will help you piece together your own puzzle. So as I shared, for starters, both of these things share a couple of things in common. Villus atrophy being one of them. Either of the conditions could have villus atrophy with more of a strong case for celiac disease or more, more profound villus atrophy being seen in celiacs, but nonetheless, both of them definitely can cause inflammation and both of them can cause nutrient deficiencies. So if you think about, let's take humble iron, one of my absolute favorites just iron deficiency, if nothing else. If you have villus atrophy from celiac disease, or if you have the inflammation and the villus atrophy and the leaky gut with SIBO, oh, side note, leaky gut also can go with, with celiac disease. This is like leaky gut on steroids versus oftentimes a little bit more run of the mill leaky gut in my experience. But leaky gut also makes the list. Well, think if you have that inflammation or villus atrophy or leaky gut, and you can't absorb iron as efficiently, or maybe you have low stomach acid and you can't digest iron, well, iron is needed to bring oxygen to all the tissues of your body, including your nerves, including your gut lining, including your colon, your pancreas, your spleen, I mean, everything. So something as simple as iron deficiency, which could be the case for either of these, iron deficiency becomes this really broad all-encompassing thing that you absolutely need to address if you stand a chance of correcting either of these conditions. So the nutrient deficiency thing could become a really, really big deal. 
Also, in the case of celiac disease, there was a really good article. Um, I'll link it in the description somewhere. There was a 2020 article where they talked a little bit about this correlation, and they talked about some hypotheses of why you might develop SIBO after celiac disease. And two of the things that they talked about were poor motility, which again, dysmotility comes up here as well. It's very sloppy handwriting, but you'll have to deal. Dysmotility or poor motility. And also there's an increased incidence of things like gastroparesis or delayed stomach emptying, which is its own flavor of poor motility. And the changes in immune dysfunction and inflammation that comes from celiac disease. But here's where things get a little bit tricky. Celiac disease can actually cause SIBO or the symptoms of SIBO for some people because of the dietary changes. So let's see, change. And this is something to be really, really mindful of. So there was an article, I think it was 2012, so it's an oldie but goodie, and they referenced that in this 2020 paper where they took people who did not have SIBO, they did not have any symptoms of SIBO, and they took them from a relatively high fiber diet to a diet that is more heavy in refined carbs and sugar and much lower in fiber. And within the span of only a week or two, those patients started developing symptoms of SIBO and the dysbiosis that goes with SIBO. So they basically created SIBO in the case of these people who they took from a relatively high fiber diverse diet and brought them down to a high simple sugar and high simple carbohydrate diet. And if you think about when people go on the gluten-free diet for celiac disease, especially in this day and age, oftentimes that does deprive you of fiber and lead to a more refined carbohydrate rich diet, unfortunately. Now, I remember when I first met my very first celiac friend in 2004, she had no options. <laughs> For better or worse, she had no options whatsoever. She could only eat fruits, veggies, and meat, pretty much. She didn't have gluten-free pasta. She didn't have gluten-free Pop-Tarts, gluten-free cupcakes, gluten-free muffins, gluten-free you know, Ben and Jerry's, whatever it might be. She didn't have those options, so she had to eat a healthy, diverse diet because that's all that was safe for her to eat. Versus nowadays in the 2020s, God, I mean, they have gluten-free everything. They have gluten-free pierogies, gluten-free, again, I said Pop-Tarts, uh, gluten-free Oreos for crying out loud. And I'm not really arguing for that. Like I definitely pound down some gluten-free Oreos. I'm not going to lie. But it's that when people are not as mindful of the fiber and the nutrition, it becomes a very slippery slope over relying on gluten-free processed foods and convenience foods. It becomes very, very easy to fall into this rut of high in refined carbohydrates, higher in sugar, less diverse, and less fiber. And that is breeding ground for SIBO. And more importantly, not just the overgrowth, not just the quantity issue with SIBO, but also the symptoms that are associated with SIBO. In that 2012 study, they showed that people who just have an overgrowth, but they don't have dysbiosis and a decrease in diversity, those people actually don't have symptoms of SIBO, even though they have an overgrowth versus the people who have an overgrowth and they also have lower diversity in the small bowel, they become symptomatic. So that is something to keep in mind if you are newly diagnosed with celiac disease or if you know that you've been gluten-free for a while, please, please, please make sure that you're getting enough fiber, bare minimum 25 grams a day, but we should all be shooting for higher than that and make sure that you're getting some diversity, trying new fruits and veggies and really, really trying to keep those gluten-free convenience foods as treats only and not relying them in your day-to-day -day life to the best of your ability. So that is the biggest arrow going this way, in my opinion. Again, both of these things can have poor motility, gastroparesis, changes in immune function, inflammation, low HCL, which I don't think I put on here, aka hypochlorhydria leaky gut, nutritional deficiencies. I mean, all of those stand to reason for both celiac disease and SIBO. The other thing that I wanna share that is again, a bi-directional arrow, it could come from one or the other, is changes in your immune defenses against microbes or your antimicrobial defense systems. So normally, and we'll just use the villus atrophy conversation as one example of this. Again, normally we have these nice big villi that kind of look like fingers. And then we have individual cells along the villi. You can kind of imagine if I drew it all in. 
all those cells of the immune system are hanging out in the villi just underneath the gut lining. So you can imagine like if we were to zoom in here, right? We have these little individual cells that are absorbing nutrients. We've got, you know, the gut wall, and then you have your immune system hanging out underneath. So here's an immune cell. So here's your immune cells. Here's your gut lining, the gut epithelial cells that are absorbing your nutrients on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we have a nice mucus layer, which Lord knows I've talked about an awful lot on this channel. If you haven't seen those videos, go check them out. And then on the other side of that fence, we have microbes. So here's your microbiome, here's your food, here's your nutrients. And in an ideal scenario, we would have checks and balances to keep the microbes on one side of the fence and keep the immune system on the other side of the fence, right? But in the case of, let's say, villus atrophy, let's say that these get shaved down to little nubs and now you've lost a lot of your surface area, there's a high likelihood that people who have villus atrophy from either SIBO or celiac disease would have pretty profound leaky gut, like, likely changes in goblet cell secretions and mucus production, which again, a lot of that goes back to the diversity and the dietary changes, but less diversity equals less healthy mucus equals less defense against your microbes. There are also cells called panneth cells that live in the small intestine. Eventually I'm gonna do a video on them actually. But these panneth cells secrete antimicrobial peptides and they need fat soluble vitamins, particularly vitamin D and vitamin A, which are two of the common nutritional deficiencies I see amongst celiacs and SIBO patients. So a decrease in those nutrients equals a decrease in panneth cell output, decrease in antimicrobial peptides, and those are like your natural antibiotics that help manage your microbes. So less mucus, less antimicrobial peptides, less surface area to interact with your microbes, and there could be compromises in things like secretory IgA, or even things like calprotectin. Calprotectin is made by the immune system in response to inflammation. And we don't fully comprehend what calprotectin does for us yet. So there's a lot of changes that can come from this mucosal surface, from the gut surface, from either celiac disease or SIBO or both that could drive the other. If you have a little bit of villus atrophy, decrease in mucus, decrease in antimicrobial peptides, you know, a little bit of an uptick in calprotectin and some inflammation and some dysmotility, yeah, you're gonna get SIBO, but then that could also be the trigger that you need to launch into full-blown celiac disease. Remember, 40% of people have a celiac gene only one or 2% of the population get celiac disease. You need that trigger. You need that oomph to get your immune system to go the direction of full-blown celiac disease. So certainly these changes could trigger celiac disease. But similarly, if you have villus atrophy, leaky gut, change in diet, poor motility, question mark, because of the celiac disease, then that could certainly set the stage for SIBO, particularly if you go on a gluten-free diet and then you over-rely on gluten-free processed foods. So the, the web is very complicated, the web is very dense, but the connections are certainly there. And I've seen it myself, if you don't have a full response to a gluten-free diet, you still struggle with nutritional deficiencies, bloating, diarrhea, then by all means get tested for SIBO and get evaluated for that, and then try to understand your root causes, try to dissect your own web or work with somebody who can help you, and then that should re resolve the symptoms that you're experiencing. Guys, as always, thank you for tuning in. I know this was a really long video and I appreciate the support and tuning in. If you found this video helpful, I would absolutely adore it if you could share this in any of your gluten-free or celiac groups. Get the word out, help me spread the word among celiacs in particular. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.